to cry the tears of a god, to breathe a goddess rage, to suffer divine passions and enter eternal bonds of love and companionship, to demonstrate great qualities and virtues and honor my social bonds, my place in the mythic community. It is the Bajaisi at their peak who most deserve the name scholars have given to the first era of our history, the heroic age. For the epitome of a life well lived to them was to survive in the tales and goodness of one's community, and this propelled them to the feats that inspired the great tales of old. At first glance, the Bajaisi may appear like siblings of the Sameisi. They were the only seafaring culture of the north, a dozen city-states competing for military and cultural hegemony, who used their privileged access to metal mines and sea routes as a basis for widespread colonialization. But unlike the Samese, the Bachaise had never made the experience of being hunted, of seeking refuge. Much rather, it seems to me, now looking back at my forefathers, that they were a warring people, filled with rage that sought to defend their shore against strangers from the mountains while eagerly laying claim to many lands themselves. And yet, as the Same, the Bachai were a complicated people, who brought about many astonishing things. Indeed, the Bachai history of origins begins with strife and downfall. The story they told themselves about the roots of their own society revolved around a pantheon of fierce and jealous gods that all aspired to rule over the world of their creations while refusing to concede or bow to anyone. And so, they revolted against each other until most of their force was spent and they were beaten. Thus, up stood some of their children, the founding fathers of the Bajaisi, later called Antaisi, to replace the ruthless gods and assume dominion over their own people. Some of the gods were appalled by this revolt and, still wielding forces of great destruction, threatened to wipe out the usurpers and all their kin, upon which their brothers and sisters vowed to break the world, should they dare to bring calamity over their children. Facing the end of all their creations and their own demise, the wrathful gods resentfully agreed to a peace, and so the gods left the land to mortal rule. To not severe the bond to their children entirely, however, the gods forged a number of powerful artifacts that contained some of their force and passions, the Pelaisi. The Bachai therefore believed that the Pelaisi of their days were the lesser descendants of original ones used to seal the bonds between the gods and the Antaisi, the mythical founders of their own tribes. The Bachai looked back to a history of descent and downfall and onto a world once occupied by gods and heroes, now by men of virtue and soon by those without it. It was this myth, among other things, that enjoyed massive popularity until the end of the heroic age and that was mounted against those that the Bachai saw as people lesser than themselves. To the Bachai, the bickering and treachery of the gods was a warning to their own people, one that they often overheard. To the Bachai, the world was filled with divine passions. Emotive disruptions were suffered by everyone, for strong emotions in their beliefs were the effects of others' good wishes or harmful ambitions towards oneself. In the great myths of the Bachai, the courage and wrath of great heroes was thus an expression of their companions' love and the curses of their foes. A person's emotions thus revealed what attitudes her community had towards her. Similarly, the attitudes of the gods were believed to have great impact on someone, though this was more associated with how they lived their life at large. Moods and emotions were therefore seen as expressions of changing luck and social bonds, whereas virtues and temper were seen as expressions of divine goodwill. Both were forces that emanated from the divine ancestral relationship, and they constituted the tragic fate of the mythic community, as did death and natural disaster. Favor and spite of the gods were revealed over the course of a person's life, but of course the Bachai sought to glimpse into their fate before it manifested. To do so, they made use of the Palaisi in two different ways. The great tribes of the Bachai prided themselves with preserving their lineage dating back to the Antaisi and the gods' retreat, thus their Palaisi were filled with divine emotions. But these were like a tempest at sea, nebulous, tumultuous, and overwhelming. They were likely impossible to understand, and there was a risk to looking into a god's mind. Thus the Bachai dared not to lay hands on one of the great Pelaisi all too often. This they only did at select moments, when they would forge a bond with a dear companion, when they would venture out with for riches, or when they would enter marriage. Whom they had chosen as worthy of their friendship thus gained a glimpse into the memories of their ancestors. Importantly, both parties would interact with the Pelai simultaneously, granting each other a glimpse into the other's intentions. 
What emotions the two parties thus read in each other's mind therefore had deep meaning, for they would not only sense if the other's intentions were sincere and good, but also since their emotions embodied the attitudes of others, what fate was generally prepared for their undertakings. Whenever the Pelaisi were so used to seal bonds of friendship or marriage and proclaim oaths of loyalty, the Bachai did so during ritualized banquets. Since emotions had strong provocative effects and were embodied in expressive ways up until madness, sacrifices would be made to ward off the disruptive effects of divine or human intervention through emotions. These were moments of intense passion to the Bachai and they seldom knew how to make clear sense of them. Instead, when they sought to hear the gods' verdict more clearly, they did so through a vessel. And so oracles were built at significant places. A king or hero who possessed a pelai offered it to the oracle, who would interact with it and announce the wills and moods of the gods. Their verdicts were rarely clear, but it was better than nothing. There was yet another way to reveal the attitudes of the gods in pure form, which typically came to happen by the end of a king's rule. He would then invite his allies and sometimes his foes to a great feast called Pethea. The main act of the Pethea was preceded by a ceremony as part of which an oracle was invited to transfer the impressions held by the Pelai onto a second one. This was to be a pure Pelai if one could be obtained, and after it had been so filled with the tribe's impressions, it was destroyed and its fragments were used to prepare a special wine called Pelai Cha. This drink, filled with godly emotion, in the case of a Pelai of the Antaise, was divine to the Bachaise and it caused profound and intense impressions on the minds of those to drink it. Consuming this wine in company was the main act of the Pethea, and it was not unusual that one of the guests would be driven into madness, and thus it was a special praise to a king's legacy if none of his guests would be shaken by turmoil. The oracle to prepare the Pelaicha would attend the ceremony and behold everyone's emotions to announce in the end what divine attitudes he read in their demeanor. In later days, poets, originally part of the Pethea as musicians and entertainers, then as actors and storytellers, were tasked with writing down the fate of a king, trying to make sense of the oracle's ambiguity and frenzied symposium partakers. Oracles and Pethea were connected in a symbiotic relationship, and over time they were interwoven. Thus new oracles came into life as different cults formed in Bachai culture. There were oracles that were associated with a specific divinity's characteristic emotion, in which they would immerse themselves in constantly refueling intensity, making use of Pelaicha in mystic rituals. A holder of a Pelai could offer it to be involved in the ceremony and receive it back with an imprint of divine emotion. These oracles would be honored as the highest of Bachane and form part of a shared culture, but against their reputation, they were rather late inventions. Pethea and oracles constituted shared cultural institutions among the Bachaise, used to broker deals among warring tribes that, however, never extended to fixed agreements between cities and remained tied to bonds of personal allegiance. The voices of the oracles would also be heard if there were conflicts that threatened to ignite larger wars among the Bachaise, as well as when there were disputes about what customs were to be held as confirming to the ways of the gods. Outsiders did not qualify to partake in the Pethea or to consult an oracle, as they were not part of the mythic community descending from the Antaise. Therefore, even though the Bachai were pragmatic in pursuing their interests and would enter alliances with outsiders such as the Samese, these to them were only secondary allies and betrayals were acceptable. This of course led to ambivalent relations and general suspicion. Similarly, there was a clear divide in Bachai culture between the royalty descending from the Antaise and tribes with other Pelaisi or even those without them. So through the generations as city-states became more and more important anchors to an individual's identity, more so than a tribe, ancestry and myths slowly made place for new forms of community and political organization. And yet a place in stories is what continued to give home to the Bachai and their successors, and claiming a grand place in the myths of future generations was what made them divine and granted them escape of mortality. This required success in competition but also favorable bonds. For it is companionship and love that constituted their attempts toward of death and diminishment. And perhaps it was these forces that readied their descendants for the greatest conquest this world has ever seen. But this shall be a story for another day.